I decided to stay at the Royal Hotel. If it was good enough for Lord Nelson and his paramour Lady Hamilton, I thought it should be to, up to my standards. They served a good haunch of mutton there too. The other patrons didn't seem to notice me. Maybe I was invisible. I have to tell you, the mattress was strange. It was like a big pillow. I sunk into it, but it didn't spring back. For sleep, I prefer 2020. My room overlooked the pebbly beach. The continuous sound of the waves raking over the stones was soothing. Lucky it was calm night. I couldn't imagine the fear of being here in a storm. Another thing, the windows rattled all night long. Very early in the morning, before light, there was a lot of commotion on the capstan grounds. Boats coming in, muffled talk, then silence. There still seems to be irregular work going on here. Before leaving, I looked over the Fountain Inn and the red brick building behind it. Here, Newtons had lived for three generations. It was tall, narrow and dark, with so many stairs to climb. My room at the Royal was on the lower level, right by the stairs. A narrow alley separated the Royal from the Fountain Inn and gave access to Newton's place behind. Too close to the sea on high tide for me, but close to your boats and tackle for boatmen, I guess. It was a cold walk along Beach Street. The wind was coming from the north and I was heading straight into it. When I reached the capstan grounds, I saw boats had been tidied up from last week's rough weather. It took longer for the front door to open this time, a different door to older but obviously related. Come in, come in. Mum's excited about your visit. I'm Mary Spears from number seven, by the way. Jemima's room was to the left. Thankfully, there was a decent fire in the grate and the room was lovely and warm. Smoky though, with the wind blowing down the chimney and there was a powerful smell of fish. It took me time to get adjusted to the thick atmosphere. Jemima was sitting at the table. Turner's sketch was there, pride of place, along with an aspidestra. She'd been preparing for the visit. Her bed was in the living room and half filled, but it saved her from taking the stairs. The bed was neatly made. The rest of the room was pretty lay as fair. Mary took my jacket and tossed it on the quilt. I felt at home in this cosy, cluttered ambience. Mary started the ball rolling. I'll make some tea, don't you think, Jemima? Oh, yes, please, dear, do. Jemima was excited to be hostessing such an unusual guest. It was fun to see her pleasure. She swept the Saturday edition of the Dover Telegraph off the dining chair and onto the floor. Oh, please, dear, please sit. I've just been reading the obituaries. There's a lot of them to get through. I agreed. I do that at home nowadays. Most entries are younger than I am. Did you know many of them? A few each week. Most of mine have died already, but let's not get downcast. Mary had brought in the teapot. She collected cups and saucers from the shelf and set them on the table. Do you want me to pour, Jemima? Oh, yes, please, dear. Yes, please. It was touching. She was thrilled to be served. With the tea, milk and sugar all sorted, the three of us sat down for a long gossip. Mary was with us for a while, then she went off to the grocer's and the fish stall. She'd be back in an hour or so, but before leaving she checked upstairs, and I couldn't help but hear. There was an almost continuous coughing coming from a bedroom. Jemima saw my concern. Um, that's Harriet, dear. She's so weak some days the cough never stops. William's worse, but he struggled out today to see if there was any work. Not likely, but he keeps trying. Jemima was resigned to the problem, but the worry was palatable. We turned to her reminiscences. I read the telegraph from front to back. I like to read what's going on. Jemima was born in the Regency era, when the literacy rate for girls from rural areas was low, so she was proud to be literate. I, I was young, about five, and mother got sick after Martha the baby was born. She never really recovered. You know, I hardly remember my mother. Elizabeth and Abigail, my big sisters, looked after me. They helped me with my letters. Jemima went to Sunday school at St Mary Magdalene, the local parish church in Denton. The instructors there helped us to read. Then we'd be able to read the Bible when we grew up, but I didn't. I read the newspaper. Lizzie and Abigail would help me with my words. Well, with everything, really. Lizzie died just last year. Again she fell quiet. 
Preble Cottage was a busy crowded home. Jemima's father married soon after his first wife Mary died. It was quite customary. A man needed help with his family and with his own needs of course. There was a new baby nearly every year. Jemima helped with chores, fed the chickens, scared the birds and later helped watch the newborns. She probably felt lost in the crush of course but she didn't know any different. My brother Preble, I just loved him and he looked out for me. He was ten years older. A year after Mum died, he left. Took the stagecoach down to Dover. He was a good strong worker, but he wasn't interested in working on the land. Work was scarce in those days, and the pay bad. Cause all the new machinery coming in. There was all kinds of work in Dover, what with the French wars, Napoleon kept everybody busy. Preble became a boatman. He'd write me letters and of course I could read. He said I could come to Dover. That got me all excited. When he married Martha, he invited me to live with them there. He told Dad I'd be a big help. Dad was glad to see me off. The cottage was so overcrowded. The fire needed attending. We were getting chilled. I put some coal on it and poked the embers back to life. Jemima pulled her blue and white shawl out of the cupboard. Blue and white. It reminded her of James, her deceased husband. We changed the topic. That's how I met James. He and Preble were friends and in the boat business. James came down from Deal in his boat and he stayed with Preble and Martha. I, I was home. Sunday was my day off and that's how it all started. Simple as that. Again she fell quiet. James had been dead six years and her life had completely changed. In Dover I worked for a good family. The husband was a Navy officer and his wife Mary, she was a darling and so good to me. She had a club foot. Where was this story going? My mind was wondering. I was thinking how rare it is to see a club foot in 2020. In my youth I recall seeing a few older folk hobbling around in special orthopaedic boots. Well, back to the dialogue. She had a club foot and one daughter. I smiled. The two didn't seem to really go together. Uh, that didn't come out quite right, did it? She laughed. Sarah, the daughter, was mine. I wasn't much older myself. Well, Mary needed help with Sarah because she was going to a dame school. In the mornings, I'd help Sarah get dressed and then I'd walk with her to the school. Mary could only hobble about slowly. This was so lucky for me. I got to stay in the class and I learned along with the other girls. After, I'd walk Sarah home help with supper and we'd go over the schoolwork together. During the week I lived there. I'd help the washerwoman, only a little bit, and I dusted but mostly I helped with Sarah. Then I'd go to the Prebbles on Sundays. I was so excited when James came calling. Of course I wanted to know all about him. He told me he lived behind the Fountain Inn on Beach Street with his widowed mother and his three sisters. His father had died in Port au Prince, Haiti, when James was 12. What was he doing there? I asked Jemina. Thought he'd been a seaman. There was a large trade to Haiti, slave ships and cargo ships, but she wasn't sure. What Jemima wanted to talk about was Lady Emma Hamilton, Lord Nelson's lover. Nelson used to have rooms at the Royal Hotel, right next door to the Fountain Inn, and the Newtons. When he was in Dill, Lady Hamilton would come and stay with him. He was a scandal, worthy of the National Enquirer or the Daily Mail. Back to Jemina's courtship. Uh, James and I would go walking down to Dover Harbour. We'd look at the ships and talk about, well, you know, what you talk about when you're in love. He told me how Lady Hamilton stayed right next door to him and how she'd sometimes stroll along the seafront. He said she was gorgeous. And he said that I was just as gorgeous. Such a flatterer. But I fell for it. We married in Deal on May the 29th, 1805. We were so young, but we were ready. Me 16, well, two days away from 17, and James 22. I moved in with his family. In October, I was pregnant with our first. That month, on October the 5th, Lord Nelson died at Trafalgar. Britain's greatest seaman was brought home in his ship the victory and laid the anchor in the downs right here in front of the Royal Hotel we all went down to the shore to pay our respects what a sight I'll always remember it 
poor Lady Hamilton, things didn't work out well for her. Mary had returned. She came in to warm up before the fire. Still raw outside, I'll make some tea. You'll like cake, I'm sure. She cleared away the morning crockery and got busy again. Then Jemima started into a long list of her children. James Preble, the name again, her first child, was born in 1806. He became a mariner, following his father's footsteps. On July the 15th, 1832, he married Maria Baker and they set up home on Lower Street. They never had children and maybe it was for the best. James was lost at sea in 1843. That was just a year after my twins had drowned. They were born together and died together. Ah, uh, here comes my second child now with the tea, my dearest Mary Preble. You arrived in 1808. What would I do without you? Mary sat the tray on the table, went over to the cupboard and took out three glasses and a bottle. That brandy, quite a fine bottle, she said, pouring a seizure glass. Tea, brandy and cake. You'll be needing this, Mum. It's a sad story. Mary settled over the little sofa. All Jemima's sons and son-in-laws were mariners, with one exception. Her third child, Jemima Dorcas, married Richard Dixon. He was a milkman. Now, to me, milkman delivers milk door to door. When I was young, that's how you got your milk, but to Jemima, a milkman looked after a dairy herd and milked them. Um, my Jemima went back to Preble country. Richard looked after cows on a farm in Athorn, no distance from Denton, where I was born. Now my Jemina's oldest. William was just three years younger than my youngest. That's your husband, great-great-grandpa Edward Preble. Well, with four youngsters at home, here at the Seagirt, and the roads difficult to travel, I rarely saw Jemina, or her three children, William, Mary and Sarah. That was their names. Our conversation turned to the 1840s and how life became more difficult for Dill Mariners. Long gone were the glory days of the French and Napoleonic Wars. The times of thriving, contraband and stories of spies in the town were history. Ships continued to run into difficulties on the Goodwin Sands. Rescues, reprovisioning and repairs kept some of the boatmen working and there was the fishing of course. James, Jemima's husband, used to gather with his fellow parlots in the Armouth packet, just across the street from the Seagirt. The talk was gloomy. Change wasn't doing them any good. It was the age of steam. Now steam tugs plied the Thames, and boats were taking different shipping routes to avoid the treacherous Goodwin Sands altogether. Dill was being sidelined. Jemima, now in her fifties, her husband over sixty, had lost three sons to the sea in just over a year. These were dark times. As we talked, Mary topped up the brandy. The tea and cake had long been cleared away. Jemima was rambling, rambling a little, and now she was looking back over the hard life for her fifth child, her daughter, Sarah. And all of a sudden, Charles Dickens came into our chat. No, Charles Dickens stayed in town at the Swan on Queen Street. The Minster to Deal railway line opened in 1847. He came for the opening. They said he spent his time writing whilst he was here. Maybe it was David Copperfield. Now, do you remember how David had lived with Pigotti in his upturned barge on the beach? In the book it wasn't on Dill Beach, it was Yarmouth Beach, but it could have been Dill Beach. Oh, Clara and Daniel Pogarty, they were my favourites. Jemima loved reading Dickens. Me and my friend Sarah Smith shared a shilling serial subscription what a tongue twister that was. Under the influence of the brandy, it came out as a great big hiss. Every month there was a new episode of David Copperfield. We paid sixpence each and shared the copy. Sarah used to read it aloud to a group of women who gathered at the reading rooms, if I remember right. They each paid a penny, or half penny, whatever they could afford, and gave it to Sarah, and she read to them. They couldn't read. Often Sarah's readings paid for the whole cost of the copy. Unfortunately, I couldn't help her at the time because in 1850, as the monthly episodes come out, I was busy with my Sarah. <laughs>